Apologies to everyone for keeping them waiting. We are conscious that we have over 100 people with us right now. But we can only start once our guests are there. Abha, I suggest uh, we'll give it another minute and then we'll start. Okay. Um, in any case, uh, uh, I'll structure the question so that we bring in Vipul a few minutes later. Uh, hopefully, by which time he should have sorted out his technical issues. So, maybe another 30 seconds. Let's get started.
So good evening and welcome you all to today's session on ESG and the difference it can make to your organization. The session is hosted by Figi Center for Sustainability Leadership, which has been set up to support the sustainability journey of corporate India and help improve its performance on ESG parameters. The center's founding member is Hindustan Unilever Limited, a company which believes that business must have a purpose beyond profit and is making sustainable living commonplace while delivering superior performance. The center's knowledge partner is eCube Investment Advisors, an ESG-focused investment and advisory platform, supporting investors and companies in their ESG journey. On behalf of the FIKI Center, we are extremely delighted to welcome our expert panelists today, Dr. Stuart Hart, Mr. Vipul Arora, and Dr. Mukund Rajan. Dr. Hart is one of the founding fathers of corporate sustainability in the West and a globally renowned sustainability strategist and a Fortune 500 consultant. Mr. Vipul Arora is a pioneer of ESG in emerging markets having shaped the growth of ESG rating industry. He serves as partner ESG and climate solutions at Sattva Consulting. Dr. Mukund Rajan is chairman of eCube Investment Advisors. Dr. Rajan serves as mentor of FIKI Environment and Climate Change Committee and was also a member of SEBI's ESG Advisory Committee. His book on corporate responsibility and ESG titled Outlast, How ESG Can Benefit Your Business won the Green Literature Festival Owner Book Award in 2022 for business literature. Before I request Dr. Rajan to conduct the session today, I want to remind you all to type in your questions for our expert panelists in the Q&A box. We will make every effort to take them up after the discussions. Over to you, Dr. Rajan. Thank you so much. I, I see that Vipul has joined us. So his camera perhaps is still not working. Uh, I've asked Shikhar to try and help him out. Uh, but thank you very much, Abha. And it's really a great pleasure to host this fireside chat today uh, for FIKI Center for Sustainability Leadership. Uh, we are going to be discussing ESG, uh, Environment, Social and Governance, and its past, present and future. Uh, and as Abha said, our very distinguished guest today are Professor Stuart Hart, one of the founding fathers of the corporate sustainability movement, a highly acclaimed academic, uh, someone who has really held chairs and helped launch centers for sustainable business at several of the leading universities in the United States, and has also advised a number of Fortune 500 enterprises. And of course, uh, Vipul Arora, who's been a trailblazer in emerging markets ESG ratings. Uh, he's the author of Essence, of ESG, a practitioner's perspective, which has just been released. So you might in some ways describe today's discussion as also the virtual launch of Whipple's book. So congratulations to Whipple for that. Uh, we have a little under an hour for our chat. Uh, I plan to direct several questions to Stuart and to Whipple, and we'll keep some time towards the end for questions from our audience. Uh, these, as um, I just mentioned, can be posted on the chat box and time permitting, we will take up as many questions as possible. So let's get started. Uh, my first question is to Stuart. Uh, you've been intimately involved with the corporate sustainability movement for several decades now. So can you start us off by giving a brief overview of the critical themes that have played out over the past five decades? and the ones that you now see impacting the corporate landscape. Yeah, absolutely, Mook, and th thank, you, thank you for having me, by the way. And I see Vipul is here. Wonderful. Vipul, let's make sure we can hear you. Yes, too. Thank you so much. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Wonderful. Starting wonderful. Trouble, uh, thanks, Mukun. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let, let me try to give a brief thumbnail of, of, you know, at least from my perspective, sitting here in America, right, of, of how things have evolved. And, and we have certainly come a long, long distance over the last 50 years, to be sure. If I think back, you know, on my, like, growing up 
as an American in the, like the 1950s and 60s, uh, the best way I could summarize it is, you know, what, what I was often told by my elders, which was when I went outside and I saw soot in the air and smelled the smoke, uh, it was described as the smell of money. <laughs> and, and, and that was probably one of the things that inspired me to get into this space in the first place, right? That it just didn't seem to make any sense that that should be a, a necessary component of, quote, progress. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> by the 70s, you know, we had at least, you know, kind of moved on to the point where there was strong government regulatory action in the form of end of pipe pollution control, right? Which certainly did have a positive impact. It did reduce emissions, but it came at a cost, literally and figuratively. You know, the, the cost was that end of pipe pollution control always costs more, right? Because obviously, pollution control equipment is additional to what the company is already trying to do from a production point of view. So by definition, it's added cost. Uh, but it also came at the cost, I think, of convincing a generation of business leaders that this thing about environment, and then later when the, when the social angle became more, uh, more significant, that, that, you know, that this just simply was not something that was gonna be good for business, that it, it really wasn't, it, you know, just it, it put a negative spin on it that probably continues to this day. Uh, but then emerged, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, the eco-efficiency movement, which is, which is what, for me, really opened the door. I was a young business school professor, you know, at the University of Michigan at the time in the late 80s. Uh, and that's really what sort of made the idea of environment or sustainability uh, palatable to business schools, because for the first time, it became clear that, at least from an eco-efficiency and pollution prevention point of view, you could actually reduce cost and risk and drop that to the bottom line fairly quickly, right? And, uh, and of course, we've played that one out pretty far. There's still plenty of companies in the world, including, you know, pro probably hundreds of thousands of, of small and medium-sized enterprises in India that are yet to even get on that journey. Uh, but still, I would say that eco-efficiency journey is pretty well underway. Uh, and by, we, by the time we were into the deeper into the 90s, I think it became clear that just cleaning up facilities wasn't gonna do it either. And that kind of took us into what I call the product stewardship era, which we're still in, right? We still have yet to really make good on that promise either, right? The product stewardship, of course, has to do with uh, not just the, you know, kind of four walls of the company, what we now call scope one and two, but rather scope three, right? The entire value chain of the company upstream in terms of uh, raw materials, suppliers, and so forth, and downstream the impact of the product and use and the end of its useful life. We're still living that one out, right? That That's still something that we're trying to come to grips with, but the, but the challenges didn't stop, right? And so I think simultaneously, simultaneously with product stewardship, by the time, you know, we had the turn of the century into the 21st century, the challenges around more fundamental sustainable innovation, in other words, shifting the entire competency base of the company to inherently clean and regenerative technology and not just being less bad, as Bill McDonough would say, uh, became increasingly significant, as did, you know, realizing that poverty and inequality were a key part of, the, of this mental map of sustainability. Uh, so the idea of business as a force for serving and lifting the underserved at the base of the income pyramid, uh, it was a piece that, you know, C.K. Prahlad and I wrote now 25, 20 plus years ago called The Fortunate at the Bottom of the Pyramid. Uh, and, and so the idea of innovating not only technologically from the standpoint of inherently clean and, and regenerative technology, but also, and perhaps in addition to, serving the underserved, right? And that in many cases, those, those disruptive technologies could come to fruition first in the underserved space. So I think we're, we're still just at the beginning stages of that too, as a strategy right, for, for business even though it's been 20 years, right? So, and the, and the fact that we've moved so slowly, I would say in, in making the transformational changes that are needed, probably is the result of the dominance of the way capitalism has been committed for the last 30 or 40 years, driven by the West, namely shareholder primacy, you know, as sort of the objective function, you know, and, 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 and rules of the road for the way business should be conducted. Uh, and, and shareholder primacy has kind of forced, you know, a shorter term view, made the kind of long term investments in clean technology and serving the underserved more problematic and difficult, which takes us, I think, to where we are now, kind of the, the, the final, I don't know if it's the final stage, but I think it's kind of the current challenge front <laughs> where we are, which is 
looking as business leaders to take on the system itself, right? How do we shift the rules of the road for capitalism itself? You know, kind of the idea of system change, you know, and perhaps shifting to a truly sustainable form of capitalism itself, which means changing the rules of the road. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, for that overview. We're going to dive deeper into some of those questions, including your perspectives on the future of capitalism, as we know it a little later. Uh, but you, you did touch upon the concept of the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, which you really propounded with Professor C.K. Prahalad. Could you perhaps reflect on this thesis and how it's actually played out in these past two decades since the time we came up with this notion? And going forward, how might ESG considerations in particular influence how businesses uh, think they should address emerging demand in developing economies like India? Yeah, certainly, certainly. So, yeah, when, when CK and I first, you know, our, our, the thinking about this kind of started in the late 90s. And we we wrote a piece that was entitled, as I recall, it was, it was uh, Strategies for the Bottom of the Pyramid, colon, Creating Sustainable Development. And the and and we tried to publish it uh, several times uh, to no avail. Uh, so it was three or four years. It became sort of an internet paper, right? They got a fair amount of circulation, and there were, of course, already companies beginning to take this on, like Unilever, right? And and Hindustan Unilever, you know, like back in the day, uh, already there was, you know, there there was an effort to try to put this into play. But it was still, you know, I, I would say a, fair, a fairly strange idea for, you know, a lot of a lot of large corporations, especially Western corporations. Uh, and so once that, you know, once that was finally published, which was in two, early 2002, that, you know, sort of combined with the work that was already going on in, in microcredit, you know, in, and in social entrepreneurship and microenterprise, I think the combination of those two things gave lift to you know a, a bit of a business movement that uh, that started in the first decade of the 2000s a lot of companies you know made it you know started initiatives that what i would describe as you know uh my you know, my also colleague ted london who's at the university of michigan and i sort of published a book a decade later that drew the distinction between just seeking to quote find a fortune at the bottom of the pyramid which sort of implies uh, selling cheap products to poor people so as to extract what cash they have. <laughs> and that was never really the idea. Uh, but to draw a sharp distinction between that and a strategy that was really about uh, co-creating a fortune with the base of the pyramid, which implied a very different approach to developing businesses, right? Which meant uh, becoming embedded in local communities, you know, kind of understanding in a deep dialogue sense what the challenges and what the needs through the eyes of those that lived in the community were, and then fashioning business strategies and, and even product systems in order to address them. Uh, and that, that I think, you know, began, there, there began to be more sort of cases where, that we could point to as some at least modest success stories with that approach. The, the challenge was that it took long, uh, you know, it took a longer period of time than just simply, de, you know, sort of taking cost out of current products Putting them in a sachet package and, and then trying to market them, it took longer. And the and then because of what I mentioned before, the challenges around shareholder primacy, it meant it was difficult for companies. And so this term, the pioneer cap, gap, came into being, which meant, well, this time period, maybe a year or more, to to really become embedded on the ground in order to develop the relationships necessary to develop appropriate business models, uh, made it difficult, right? To kind to kind of uh, hit hurdle rates, you know, and, and get products out there quickly enough. Uh, so I would say the, the whole domain of impact investing kind of was a result of that, which was code in the early days and maybe still is to some degree uh, that you accept below market returns, right? That, that that's just that that's just the nature of the beast. And which meant that it stayed, you know, at a uh, while growing, right? Certainly a growing category, still modest in comparison to the global economy and the kinds of shifts that need to occur, let alone the numbers of people that need to be served and lifted, which brings me once again to that, to, to this kind of final stage where we are, which I think is the realization that until we actually shift the institutions and systems of capitalism to reward different behavior, uh, it's probably gonna be difficult to get there. 
Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Ripple, good to have you back. <laughs> uh, I did say when you were actually off screen, I don't know, I don't know if you heard that, that uh, you've just produced a book, The Essence of ESG, A Practitioner's Perspective. And I said today is in some ways actually the virtual launch of this book, so congratulations to you. Uh, for all our audience, uh, it's a very readable book. Thankfully, it's not very long. <laughs> it's a slim volume, a little over 100 pages, and certainly something that I would recommend to all those who want to get to some level of familiarity with the subject of ESG. Uh, so, Ripple, I'm going to start with asking you uh, about a quote in the book. You, you actually quote Mahatma Gandhi, and you say, uh, you quote him and say, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And you say that ESG has actually been going through a similar journey. What was going through your mind when you drew this particular analogy, Vipul? Thanks, Mukund. And uh, I also, before I start answering that, I want to thank you for the effort in putting this together. And, uh, and also the you know, Center for uh, Sustainable Leadership at Wiki. I want to also thank Stu. Uh, his time is very precious. So he, you know, whenever I request him, he comes along. So thanks, Stu, for, for your time as well. And I've learned a very important lesson that I need to change my laptop very quickly. So I was trying to push it as far as possible, but I think it's reached end of life. <laughs> so I need to switch it now. <laughs> so now, now right into the question. Uh, so I think, um, you know, being, so I started this journey, I, I owe it to, to Stu very much. Uh, I read his article in 97, you know, Beyond Greening, the, the one I think he, he was, he, he refers to it quite a bit because that was like when he really mapped out all these stages that, that we are going through. Um, but I've seen the ESG space right up close and personal for many years. And um, so the first three stages that, you know, we talk about, uh, they laugh at you, you know, I think I've seen that because I've got laughed at myself, you know, for many, many years when I was, uh, it used to be called in initially non-financial research and then it used to be called extra financial research. So we didn't even know what we were doing, you know, sort of, so to speak. We didn't even know what industry it is, where does it, you know, fit in. And I think uh, I'm very happy to say that now we've reached a point where we are, uh, where everybody is fighting sort of ESG, you know, it's become like the, I, I don't know. So depending upon which country you live in, it's it's either a bad word or it's you know moderately uh, toler tolerated. Uh, thankfully, in India, you know there is there is more interest on ESG. Uh, I think everybody is trying trying to fight. So it, it took a peak during COVID. Everybody realized you know uh, the priorities uh, in terms of uh, of of the growth and growth versus what are the basics in life. You know essentials. So everybody wanted clean growth, so it took off. But after that, there has been a lot of criticism. Understandable, we can talk about it. But I think everybody is fighting stage. But have we won? I think we've won also quite a bit. You know, speaking on behalf of myself and you know, spent more twenty years in this, and uh, and representing an entire community. You know, a huge amount of people, which I have, by the way, thanked in my book. You know, all those. You know, it's a big community. People who spent 20, 30, 40 years. You know, behind this. We've campaigned for laws, we've campaigned for legislation, we've campaigned, you know, and they've been very forward looking investors who come on the bandwagon, you know, and they've, you know, blessed and the UNPRI itself, you know, which, which I've traced in the book as a, as a history of, of growth of ESG. I think in one way, it's a massive win for the entire community that, uh, you know, that we have, uh, we have a massive win in terms of legislation. You know, we have legislation in Europe, we have legislation in, in India. And, and massive amount of legislation. So it has become mandatory. And that's a very big shift compared to what we were doing for all these 20 years. You know, we had to go and make a business case to the investors, we had to go and make a business case to the companies, please adopt it, it makes sense. Look at the climate, look at biodiversity, look at income inequity gaps and so on. And people were like, okay, we'll think about it. But now I think because it has become mandatory, so that's a massive win already. But obviously that still has a challenge in terms of it should not remain compliance oriented only. You know, as we, as I think three of us know very well that it has, it also creates value. It has to quickly go beyond compliance to, to value creation. And I think you've talked about that in your book as well, Mukund, you know, uh, the, the one that you wrote. So I think that is where the fight is still going on because there is, there is, there is a part of the community which is still saying, no, ESG is useless or the word has become bad or, you know, whatever, or there's greenwashing. So I think there are problems, but we have won a massive battle, but we still have quite some way to go till we can claim complete victory. 
Fascinating. Thank, thank you. Thanks for that explanation, Vipul. Um, I have to say, Vipul, you, you were in many ways ahead of your times uh, when you founded Solaron in 2007. Um, and of course, the company then went on to collaborate with several of the leading international ESG rating providers, including MSCI, Sustainalytics, and S&P, DGSI. Uh, and you rated thousands of companies during that time. Uh, by 2014, your firm was in fact ranked the number one emerging markets ESG rating firm. So for wannabe entrepreneurs, you know, a lot of young people who are on this call were keen to find a career for themselves in ESG. What advice would you have? And in particular, talk to us about some of the highs and the lows of an entrepreneurial journey, including uh, what eventually led you to sell your interest in Solar Rock in 2018 to Sustainalytics. Thanks, Mukun. Uh, I think I will I will share what I've learned myself. You know, um, so the advice for uh, young entrepreneurs, wannabe entrepreneurs, or even you know, intrapreneurs would be that you know, follow your conviction. Uh, I never got interested. I never pursued sustainability or ESG because it was a passion. It was not. It was far from it. You know, ninety seven or two thousand seven when when we started Solar On. Uh, we we did it because we believed in it deeply, uh, and the journey is you know there are wins but there are also significant setbacks. So I think one would not last this journey if we don't have conviction. And um, so I think the, one of the reasons why uh, ESG is is getting a backlash now is because post COVID many people jumped into the fray. You know they saw the opportunity. Uh, in fact, I was away from the market for a little bit. I was you know a caregiver. I went went out. I was not doing any any professional work per se. But when I came back, I was shocked because everybody was you know everybody is doing ESG. Everybody is doing climate. And you know I was like what? But I never met so many people in my entire career. And, uh, and and how is all this happening? Uh, I think it's great to to see the opportunity. It's great to jump into it, but I think we need to earn our our our, our stripes and our badges and you know the battle scars as they, as they say. So I think it's important to we need more and more people to be in the industry. But I think it's important to be authentic. It's uh, all this greenwashing, you know, criticism is simply because we are. I think in the in this in the pursuit of opportunity, we we tend to become inauthentic. But I think that's where we lose the edge. And uh, uh, one of the things I mentioned in the in the book and in a lot of things that we are doing now, Stu and me, is that I think if you boil down E, E, e is all about harmony with nature. Most people get confused and and hassled with so many hundreds of indicators, you know, and data points and KPIs, and then you do the materiality assessment. I think all that mechanics is is good, it's necessary, but you need some actionable lever. You need one one thing to understand it well, like a principle, so you can apply it and create value. So I think E is all about harmony with nature. S is all about harmony with people, and G is all about harmony with oneself. And I think that's the starting point. So if we want to pursue anything, whether it is ESG or sustainability or, or climate or or anything in the world, I think it's important to be uh, truthful to oneself. It's important to be authentic and in harmony with oneself. Otherwise, we're not going to get the result. So I think for all the wannabe entrepreneurs, you know, don't just pursue it because there's opportunity. I think opportunity comes and goes. You know, uh, and things become fashionable, and they very quickly become unfashionable. So pursue, you know, we should pursue what what we really what is our inner calling. You know, I think that then we can. And coming to your other bits about challenges, I think there were a lot of challenges uh, to build, and I realized it later because we didn't plan it. You know, we wanted to do this, we did it, and we didn't plan it. We didn't make a business plan. Interestingly, uh, you know, we never had business plan. We ran Solron for about eleven years. And uh, why did we sell our interest? A uh, very tough question. It was the toughest decision of my life. Uh, I, I I took quite some time to think about it because it was like a baby. You know, we literally, me and my wife, we built it together, and it was you know literally and figuratively it was our baby. You know, so uh, we put all our energy into it. But I think we realized as we were in the ninth, tenth year that you know we've taken on far too much uh, than than one can handle in one's life. You know, if you look at any of the, there are startups and then there are rating agencies, you know, there's a very different industry altogether. So startups you can do usually in two year, three year, four year, you can turn around, five year, you can turn around. If it's a tech startup, it's much faster. You know, we built a rating agency you know, and rating agencies, they have a life period of about, you know, at least 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, some are even 100 year old, some are 150 years old. 
so that's a it's an institutional space you're you're dealing with institutional investors it takes you three years to even show a track record to go and get a meeting you know if you've not shown uh, a methodology that delivers results for three years they will not even give you a meeting and so you so you got to first build a methodology which takes three years then you got to show track record which takes three years and then you got to go to the market and start getting clients so you've already lost five six years you know uh, and uh, it's not something that gets funding easily you know so uh, as we know because it's it, because of the same reason it has long gestation period so i think we we realized that we had solved the first piece of the problem we built a very powerful methodology which was very good for emerging markets it it had a great track record and we had let's say some traction in the market you know we we had started to get about we got about 13 trillion worth of assets using the methodology but the market is much bigger the market is you know 120 trillion plus so we we realized we had to scale and we needed funding for that and we started to go look for funding and then you know um, Sustain Analytics was uh, was saying why don't you just get on board and you know it will we'll scale it faster so i think that's what we we did it was uh, uh, at that time i think it a very good decision um, uh, it's another matter the Sustain Analytics got acquired by Morningstar which we never had foreseen uh, but i think that's you you can only decide on what you see i i hope i I've, I've done justice to to both the questions no, absolutely. Thank you for being so candid, Ripple. I think there's lots that many would be entrepreneurs on the call will benefit from what you just shared. Um, you know, it's clear that ESG metrics will certainly help corporates uh, to assist businesses, both from a risk as well as opportunity standpoint. And similarly for investors, you just mentioned the 120 trillion. Uh, you point out in your book that institutional investors managing over 60% of global investments are committed to using ESG as an additional factor in the research. But talk to us about other stakeholders, Vipul. So customers, the media, regulators, how are they leveraging access to ESG data to drive change in businesses? I think that's the, that's the next uh, battlefront, Mukund. Um, so, so clearly, I think more and more adoption is happening. If you look at more mature markets, I think it's, it's already there. So Newsweek has, for example, green, kind of green list, you know, that they uh, bring out every year. Uh, there are other, you know, uh, other forums as well. I think it's it's eventually uh, being adopted more and more in emerging markets. I think there is now increasingly a trend that there are retail investors paying attention to, to ESG criteria or, you know, whether you call it ESG or responsible investing criteria or sustainable investing criteria, doesn't matter. I mean, they're all the same. They mean the same. So I think retail investors are starting to pay attention. Uh, the, the Gen Z millennials, they're starting to become serious, even with responsible consumption. There are a lot of surveys. Uh, I, I've just looked at recently, um, you know, end of the previous year, there have been very significant surveys done globally, not just in specific markets, DM or EM. Uh, global surveys that talk about, you know, 25% people, you know, given a choice, everything being same, want more responsible products. I think responsible consumption, you know, is driving it. Retail investment as a long-term trend is driving it. So I think clearly, uh, if you talk about media, media can use this information in driving more education. You know, we need to we need to bring the focus on that we need to consume responsibly. We need to produce responsibly. We need to, you know, we have those metrics and indices, you know, and rankings available. Uh, other stakeholders in terms of regulators now, there's a tremendous amount of regulation. So I think they have access to it in India. We have the SEBI, BRSR you know, a list already. I'm sure once the data becomes uh, consistently available, they, somebody should be able to come out with a ranking in terms of who's done better and who's done less on reporting. That's an idea for you, Mukund, you're on the, on the, on the group, advisory group. And uh, I think other, uh, other stakeholders also, I think consumers, my, my dream project actually, which was something I wanted to do in 2005 and six, uh, when, I, when I was at Stanford, was to create a product rating you know, which is uh, where each product comes with its own label and a scorecard, where you have the kind of, you know, the triple bottom line. Those days it was not called ESG, so we used to call it triple bottom line kind of an assessment along with the price. And I wanted to list it on eBay or Amazon. I, want, I went looking for funding for it, couldn't get funding in those days. But I hope somebody will come and do this. And I think we have a lot of data now. Uh, we have LCA data. We have uh, also platforms that that are looking for this. So I think more and more is getting uh, adopted in in many different ways. I hope uh, there is more uh, more we see in this space. 
I think you've just given some ideas to folks on the call as well. <laughs> so hopefully some of them take up your entrepreneurial challenge, Whipple. Um, let me turn back now to Stuart. Um, Stuart, one of the challenges that uh, Whipple covers in his book is what economists describe as externalities. Uh, so too often businesses end up ignoring the true costs of their business activities. Uh, for instance, the waste they generate or their carbon emissions. So my question to you is, how much closer are we getting to ascribing an accurate cost to all such business impacts? There's also an ongoing international exercise around natural capital valuation. When do you think all these kinds of initiatives will start bearing fruit? A big question, but a really important one. Uh, and I guess I'd start by, by making the observation that the term externalities, right? So it's it's a you know roughly a century old term, right? It was coined by economists, you know, back in the starting in the late 19th century, like Alfred Marshall and Arthur Pigou, right? Uh, who wrote the book, you know, in in the 1920s entitled Welfare Economics. Uh, and, I, and I think it's important to recognize that their conception of externalities, the original conception of externalities for which the term was coined. Was a really narrow term, right? It, I mean, back then they they were consumed by the you know kind of immediate localized impacts that industrialization was having, you know, like soot and smoke and dirty water, you know, and uh, you know kind of people living in communities of squalor that lived around the you know the uh, uh, the plants themselves, you know, sort of Dickensian you know kinds of things. <laughs> And, and so, so it shouldn't surprise us that, that the initial conception was very much that, right? And, and I think what it's probably important for us to realize is that externalities as a concept, you know, as, as we now sort of envision it, is a much bigger idea, right? That many of those kind of original things that were coined externalities in some ways have already been addressed, right? That, that the logic of pollution prevention and eco-efficiency can internalize many of those externalities in ways that drop right to the bottom line, right? So in some ways, I think the original theory of externalities, and of course, back then the solution that they saw was, you know, was, was taxes, right? Pigouvian taxes on the companies in order to force them to internalize externalities. In some ways, we've already been down that path. Now, you know, as, as impacts are broader, they're regional, national, or global in scope, um, we struggle more with those conventional ways of thinking about solutions, right? So, you know, witness our struggles with the carbon tax, you know, just, just as an example, right? That, that I, I think our conception of, of this whole notion of externalities has to evolve because the, the original idea was a much narrower, you know, much narrower concept. And the idea of internalizing externalities I think in a lot of ways is defunct, right? We've already, we've already sort of done that to the extent that that can happen. And so what that means is we have to recognize that the impacts that that business and industry is having, that is having on the world have expanded significantly to the point now where in many cases, the, the broader kind of impacts, negative impacts, right? May, may if we try to put a, a dollar value on them, and as you say, there are more and more attempts to do that, in many cases, they eclipse global GDP. So the, the scale and scope, right, of the impacts we're talking about, I think, have, have mushroomed in a dramatic way, which means our thinking about this has to change, right? That it can't just be sort of causing companies to internalize their own externalities. Rather, we have to be thinking more broadly about systemic change. And that probably includes, you know, as is well underway now, a fundamental rethink of, you know, kind of macroeconomics that, you know, the notion of GDP as the measure, you know, the, the, the appropriate measure for the performance of an economy is, is obviously narrow and counterproductive because it counts all the negative kind of activities as well as the quote more positive ones. So, you know, I, I think as we, as we look forward, to get a grip on these this larger idea of externalities, which incidentally is also not just the environmental negative impacts, also the social ones. We should keep in mind that back, you know, 100 years ago, plus, you know, during the original age of, of industrialization, 
the idea of inequality wasn't really considered an externality. <laughs> Whereas I think increasingly now we recognize that it is. Uh, and we have to come to grips with that as well, you know, kind of the challenges of inequality. And so that means sort of rethinking what, you know, what's the purpose of the economy in the first place? And that means we we should measure, probably measure it differently. And for companies, so there's a macroeconomic change that I think needs to occur, you know, and that's underway. There's good thinking going on, right, in terms of redefining national economic success, right, and beyond GDP and so forth. But I think there's a microeconomic version of that too. There's a company version of that. Uh, and, and the best place to look for that, I, I would say, is you know, kind of look, look at the performance of public equity markets and sort of what, what that's deteriorated into over the last 30 or 40 years, where the metric that drives stock price in public equity markets, again, largely attributable, attributable to the rise of shareholder capitalism starting in the US in the 70s and 80s, right? That, because we should keep in mind that that's a fairly recent phenomenon, right? Was, capitalism wasn't always run that way, right? <laughs> that, 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 that we're living in, in sort of an aberration, a, a period of time when, you know, uh, quarterly earnings growth, right, is, is a primary driver of stock price. And I guess we should remember that public equity markets, especially today, given how much they've grown, look, in, in the U.S., public equity markets have have you know just just sort of the the financial sector has has grown dramatically you know then the value of financial assets now far far exceeds the kind of the main street economy and that it's largely a trading market right that in the old days the percent of activity in public equity markets of new investment was pretty substantial whereas now it's a tiny fraction right that ipos right and spacs and those kind of things i'm talking about the us now tiny fraction, right, of like less than 1% of a public public equity markets activities. The vast majority is trading. It's a pure trading market. And, it, and if you include stock buybacks by corporations, public equity markets are actually capital negative. They're extracting capital. You know, they <laughs> that, pub, that share buybacks swamp IPOs, uh, probably by a factor of four or five. So if that's the case, then a tr as a trading market, a secondary market, we could def we could say we could just simply redefine what the drivers of share price should be. What's sacred about quarterly earnings growth? And the answer is absolutely nothing, right? That it's just simply a social construction. It's a story that we've told ourselves for the last thirty or forty years, uh, and we can change it, right? We can just decide that a different set of factors should be the drivers of stock price, and just like we can redefine GDP into something different, right? As as what we're what our objective function for running the economy is, we can do the same when it comes to publicly traded companies. We can just simply redefine what the drivers of value should be. And I think that's where we are. I think lots of food for thought in what you just said. Thank, thank you for that, Stuart. Um, we will have a quick question for you. Um, you know, Stuart just mentioned that uh, there is improvement that's happening in the way we measure a lot of this some good things that are going on, both at the macro level and the micro level. Um, the methodologies for ESG assessment seem to be constantly improving. Why is it then that you, you talked about this when you opened? Uh, in some markets, ESG is not necessarily seen as a great thing. Um, and a number of investors also seem to be sometimes backpedaling or softening the sort of pro-ESG stance in recent, uh, in the last year or so particularly in the United States, uh, what's happening? Why is this? I think that's a great indication, Mukund, that ESG has been super successful, has been way more successful beyond anybody's imagination. Because I, I can tell you, you know, uh, honestly, you know, for many, many years, we never imagined, and I'm, here I'm speaking on behalf of the entire community I talks about, people who've been campaigning for regulation and, and serious action. We never imagined it'll come so quick and it'll come so fast and so aggressive. You know, I mean, we would have appreciated if the regulation would have been kind of staged out. I think it's been far more aggressive than we imagined it, which is basically the problem right now. We are in a transition issue, actually. People are not trained. Uh, accountants, uh, compliance officers, even companies don't have enough capability. I think we, so there's a talent uh, and skill shortage right now we have because the, the regulation has come on very fast and very quick. 
I think that's the part I'm not happy about, to be honest with you. I think that's creating the crunch and that's pushing people to the wall. And that's the stress companies are facing, that's the stress professionals are facing. So this is one issue which is on the side. I hope it could have been done better, but you know, you, you've dealt with the regulators, you know, regulators are regulators. You know, when they decide to do something, first of all, they, they wait for a long time and then they decide and they come like a very big stick, you know, very quick. Unfortunately, that's the reality. And I think that's what is destroying, you know, uh, the success, the, 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 the good effects of the success that ESG has, has had. The good thing is that, you know, we've, we've had legislation now, so you can't run away from it. So it is, it is mandatory. But the, the, the unfortunate bad piece is that un, it has been suddenly a, a shock and an awe moment for many industries, especially the ones which, you know, in, in the investment world, we call them stranded assets. So there are companies and, and industries and sectors which are relying on old, you know, severe old economies that are going to be left behind. Nobody is going to want to hold their stocks, you know, um, fossil fuel, uh, coal at some point, old power plants. So I think they and, and banks that are still in the operating in the old world, in the old economy, they're holding the entire old economy. They're not willing to move towards the solution, to be part of the solution providers. So I think it was a wake up call for them when all this regulatory push came up and they, they realized that it's a survival threat. You know, and I've mentioned this in, in the book as well. There is a, they realize a survival issue and they have got to push it back as far, as strong as they can. And in America, and Stuart is here, you know, he will, he will uh, testify. <laughs> in America, you know, what is the way you push back? You know, you sponsor people to write against it. You sponsor legislation and you use politics. And what's happening right now is basically in US, there's been a massive lobbying and pushing back against ESG. In fact, to the extent, something we've never imagined, never seen anywhere, that they made ESG funds illegal in certain states. You know, that's like extreme pushback. So I think th this is the fight that in the, in the in, in Mahatma Gandhi's quote that we talked about, this is the fight. So I think this is the fight that's happening in US uh, and it's spilling over in other economies. You know, interestingly, in, in Europe, where there is such a huge push on ESG, to, there also sometimes FT comes and talks against ESG, or the economist comes and talks against ESG, and then it creates headlines everywhere, and everybody gets kind of, you know, uh, stressed out of what is going on. But actually, if you if you step back a little bit and, and take a long-term perspective, you know, let's not be reactive on this, on, the, on these type of news. ESG is doing well in the long run. It's not going away anywhere anytime soon. Uh, this backlash will continue for a little bit, but I think we still have serious work to do ahead. We have, I think the work, the constructive work that we need to do is perhaps work with regulators, engage with them and say that they can go a bit slow, build capacity with accountants, build capacity. I think the, the finance minister in India recently, I think two, three months back, publicly came out and said in some lecture somewhere that uh, we need a lot of uh, accountants and auditors to, to scale up on, on ESG. I was like, great. That, that's the kind of you know direction we need. So I think the more effort we do, that's the constructive action we need to do. Training, skilling, you know, uh, upskilling, capacity building. I think the more we do that, we'll be able to tide uh, through this issue. But right now, politics is kind of destroying the 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 the, the wins that we've had, you know, unfortunately. But let's not lose heart. I think everything is going fine. We just need to. But we need to be authentic. You know, obviously, we should not be opportunistic. We should not give in to the temptation of you know. Um, presenting capability where it doesn't exist. I think everybody is in the same boat. All of us understand. Um, sustainability, I, I mentioned this in the book as well. Sustainability or ESG were never the coveted careers last 30 years. How can you expect people with 20 year experience now? You know, when I see corporates giving ads or, or consulting firms giving ads or rating firms giving ads that they want to hire somebody with this much experience. I mean, those people never exist. They, ne they don't exist. How can you try to recruit somebody? And then it creates a temptation for people, for talent pool to kind of reposition themselves. So these are the drivers, I think, why, why there's a lot of inauthenticity in the, and, and companies have the same temptations. You know, they want to reposition themselves as has been doing this for many years, but that's not the case. Everybody knows it, you know? So I think let's be authentic. Let's, let's focus on constructive action. Let's focus on training, education, capacity building, upskilling. That's, that's been a big driver for me to write this book. Uh, it's been a it's been a nightmare for me for for about a year, you know, trying to condense. I made many drafts, but uh, but it was worth. I wanted to keep it as short as possible, you know, very efficient. But I think this is the kind of effort we need to do to to really help in a constructive way. Thank you, thanks, uh, people. I, I noticed that there are a bunch of questions in the chat box, and to make sure we get enough time to address at least a few of those, I'm going to. Close out with two final questions for the two of you. 
before we move to the, uh, the Q and A with the audience. Uh, my first question is directed to Stuart, uh, and we've already touched upon this, Stuart. You've talked about uh, models of capitalism, um, and really, I guess this question is about you know with the kind of human impact that we are seeing uh, on the natural environment in particular. Uh, there are suggestions that we need to relook at sources of demand and supply and trying to control those. Uh, for instance, it's um, perhaps better to prevent greenhouse gas emissions in the first place rather than having them and then trying to offset emissions. So with this kind of possible realignment of supply and demand, do you see sustainability and ESG considerations fairly soon in the proximate future influencing a radical transformation of the way we think about global economic growth and indeed capitalism as we know it. Yeah, well, as you could probably tell from the tail end of my, the answer to the last question uh, that, that I spoke to, the, the answer to that is yes. Uh, and, and let me just give you a brief anecdote as to why we should all perhaps be kind of thinking soberly about this, you know, so uh, a, as a professor, right, I'm still in fairly regular touch with with uh, students, you know, 20 something students uh, just taught a class this past year at the Ross School of Business at Michigan, uh, a class that that I designed actually 30 years ago. Now, it's obviously evolved significantly since then, but the title of the class is strategies for sustainable development. Right? And, and in the class, we're addressing you know, I, I trace sort of the evolution, you know, in the, in the first question you asked me at the at the outset. So this class is focused more on those latter stages, right? Sort of the those things having to do with sustainable innovation, market transformation, uh, system redesign, institutional change in order to support a new kind of growth. That that's what the class focuses on. And over the course of the class, you know, I have, I tend to ask students. I do a little polling with the students, and so I have. In this particular class, you know, 60 something students in the class, uh, combination of MBAs, uh, some students from outside this business school in the environment school and public policy and engineering, but they're all, you know, I would say mid to late twenties would be the age. So sort of uh, older Gen Z, you know, younger millennial, you know, would be the, would, would be the demographic. And one of the polling question I asked was, can capitalism be redeemed? Right is can we actually transform capitalism in a way that saves it as a way of economic organizing? Can capitalism be redeemed? And the and the <laughs> and the answer was the majority of students in that class answer that question no. So <laughs> we we we're dealing with a younger with, with generations that are rising that have serious reservations as to the whether the way we've organized the world in recent memory can sustain itself. And that should give us all pause, right? That, that you know, I, I think we're in for, you know, th there's really no choice but fundamental transformation at this stage of the game, right? We, the on-ramp is gone, right? We had an on-ramp back in the 90s, right? H had we made the kinds of transformational shifts beginning then, then, you know, I think we, we would be in a different place today, but we didn't, right? So. There is no on on ramp left. There there are growing movements like the degrowth movement. I know I know a lot of people think that's fringe, uh, you know. But fringe, you know, tends to, as Vipul said earlier, uh, you know, you get laughed at initially, uh, <laughs> or, or as Gandhi said. Uh, but I wouldn't laugh, you know, at the degrowthers, right? That I think some of the really earliest writing maybe was like that, but. It has matured as a way of thinking, and if you if you look seriously at the writings about degrowth now, I think they're right. <laughs> that that you know they they expose sort of the fallacy of our thinking about green growth as a solution. You know that most of what's passed for sustainable innovation, kind of uh, tech innovation in the green tech space, you know, in the regen ag space, was, but especially in in green energy, right, and and uh, and electric vehicles and so forth. Most of that is additionality, right? In other words, this, especially when it comes to renewable energy, it's just simply covering the continuing growth in energy consumption. It's not replacing the base of fossil fuels. And, and I, that as, I think that as a, when we come to realize that, I think then, then uh, it'll dawn on us 
that what we're facing is the need for a much more fundamental change than, than simply the sort of green business strategies that we've thought about in the past. And that does then naturally lead us to recognize that what it's going to take is a changing of the rules of the game, right? So that it's that it really is about remaking capitalism for a sustainable future. That, that that's really going to be the only option looking forward, and we don't have a lot of time to make that happen. Absolutely, yeah, I think one of the most common quotes you hear from Gandhi these days uh, speaks to everything you just said uh, when he said that the world has enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. Uh, yeah. And so we need to rethink, I think, fundamentals of what we're trying to do with uh, economic transactions, the marketplace, society as a whole. But thank you for that, Stuart. Uh, my last question quickly to Vipul. Um, really to, to sum up everything that we've heard so far in, in a manner of speaking, what, what really is the future of ESG, Vipul? How important is it to the future of companies? And how critical is it for anybody who wishes to pursue a corporate career in the future? I think um, people, people get sometimes hassled between this tension between ESG and sustainability as a term. So I think I also want to address that upfront. There was a question I think in the in the chat as well about it. Uh, so ESG is a very nice tangible framework to to achieve sustainability. Otherwise, sustainability tends to be you know very very um, uh, esoteric. It's like sort of you can't touch it. Stu has done an amazing job all his life. I'm a big fan in terms of how to achieve it, but not everybody has done that. No, not everybody understands it. But I think for the masses, you know, ESG has been a great framework to kind of achieve uh, a pathway, a roadmap. So I think there is no tension between those two terms. Uh, they, they, are, they are aligned uh, one and the same two sides of the coin. I think the future of ESG, therefore, uh, I think I see a very uh, robust future in terms of as a, as, a, as a way, as a framework that helps us achieve corporate sustainability. So I think companies, they have a genetic defect Stu and I recently, you know, did a did a masterclass on uh, with ET about this. That you know, so explaining uh, about it, all the enterprises they have a sort of a genetic defect. They don't take into account the true cost of doing business. You know, whether it's environmental subsidies or social subsidies. You know, every big corporation, whether it's a public listed firm or private, they draw in a lot of resources from the government, from the society, from the nature. And I think it, all of it is not getting reflected on the balance sheet. So ESG sustainability as a way, as a principle, is helping us first see the truth about the true balance sheet, you know. And so therefore, it's it sits at the heart of the company, you know, there in 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 being truthful about what we are doing with our resources, with our P and L, and therefore for managers and people who are you know working in this uh, domain, I think it's important to to know that we need to we need to bring this authenticity. And uh, so there's a whole lot of mechanics around ESG. People get lost in that in the forest, uh, you know, uh, metrics, KPIs, and what should I do, and 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 which sector. But I think that's the easier part to handle. One can deal with 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 the with the KPIs and indicators. But I think the more difficult part is bringing the values that ESG represents. I think that's the difficult challenge. And uh, and and most people, especially in Europe, they kind of resist this conversation. You know, Europe has kind of a half um uh, understanding i mean they focus heavy on process and they and they kind of try to leave the values aside but in the east i think especially in india i think the values are an important piece of the puzzle so we cannot leave them out because if we leave the values out we won't be able to go to work tomorrow uh, what are we taking you know a bunch of processes bunch of data points bunch of indicators it's not we we bring our emotions we bring our values to the work right so we need to bring those values authenticity being responsible, ESG is all about being responsible. It's about harmony. It's about balance. So I think all those things we need to bring. And if we bring this to our work and to our role and to our job, I think we can get results. Uh, there are enough case studies uh, we mentioned in the in the book. Uh, uh, Stu is doing that as well. You've mentioned, you know, in your book as well, Mukun. So I think uh, we just need to persist with it. So it has a future. Let's stay patient. That's one of the virtues we need to implement ESG. Let's stay patient. Results will come, but it will take time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stuart, I'm going to check with you. We are at the 
end of the hour. Do you think we could borrow five more minutes of your time? Absolutely. Oh, fantastic. Um, great. I'm just looking at the chat box. My first question, um, this is a question about a point that Stuart made, but I'm going to direct it to Whipple. This is about Stuart's point on shareholder privacy, no longer being necessarily the focus. So the question is really about India. Is there a willingness of owners, Whipple, as opposed to managers or board directors to claim an environmental and social outcomes based viewpoint. So are owners now making the transition in your view to a more positive ESG orientation? I think some of them are, um, you know, the moment you connect it. So we've been doing a lot of, you know, uh, interactions in the market workshops and, and I've noticed, you know, it doesn't matter size of the firm, you know, it could be a small firm, medium firm. Uh, but the moment they, they see a connection with their values that ESG is not something foreign. It's not something Western that has come from abroad. You know, it's something that we've been living in India for many, many years. I think they immediately see an access point in terms of how they can, they can actually deploy it. And then they realize, I think the greatest moment comes when they realize they've already been doing it. It's just, they were not aware of it. I think that's a great enabler. That's a great empowering, you know, way to start. So I think. It is there, but obviously there are some gaps, you know, so it's everything is not, you know, hunky dory. There are some challenges. Sometimes they have on a specific aspect. Let's say uh, a pharma company not doing great on on water. You know, when it's a very big input, they are doing great on renewable energy, for example, which is very, you know, widely available now and at a, at a very affordable cost. But then they don't realize the importance of water or some of them don't realize the importance of waste management. So I think when you bring that in. And, and say, by the way, you know, this is important as well for your business. This is, this is really critical for your for the core of your business. I think it, it starts to people are starting to have a conversation. I think this is the great uh, uh, feedback we are getting uh, in our conversations that people, the moment you connect it, people start to see more, more value. Terrific. Good to know. Um, Stuart, this question is for you. This is from Ronak Biswas. Um, this question is how are companies handling the issue of greenwashing outside India? In India, SEBI, the Securities Exchange Board, has kind of set the stage for preventing greenwashing. But how is the rest of the world, especially the United States, responding to this problem? That's a good question. You know, it, it just just as kind of the ideas and challenges around sustainability and business have have evolved over the years, as you know, as we've talked about. Uh, I think so too has, you know, the, the idea of, I suppose that root what's underneath the idea of greenwashing is saying, saying something and doing something else. <laughs> right? uh, but, but I think what, what's, what's happened and it's interesting because, and even the terminology, you know, evolves is that, you know, the greenwashing is sort of, uh, I think out of the nineties era, right? When, when. The bulk of what the company was doing, you know, was still very much, you know, sort of was polluting and so forth. But the company would have some time, some small initiative that they could point to to try to uh, divert attention, right? And then then claim that this is, you know, put it on put it on the website and this is a big thing for. That's I think that's the definition of greenwashing, right? <laughs> to to have some initiative that you try to point everyone's attention to while the core business grinds on. You know, as it, as it always had. Today, I think the challenge has become uh, so, somewhat different. It's evolved. You know, since a lot of the, at least among the larger companies, a lot of the worst, you know, most egregious kind of emissions and waste and impacts have been dealt with through eco efficiency and, and pollution prevention. Now, I think it it's it has more to do with you know terminology like purpose wash, or or you know. My my friend and colleague who used to be a generation investment management that I think Vipple knows, a guy named Duncan Austin, has coined the term green wish. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what green wish is all about is the tendency today for, for companies to claim very sort of audacious, sometimes flowery societal purposes for their company, right? And to display that prominently on the company's website and on its uh, on its PR material that the company stands for this or our mission is this and it has to do with solving world problems and so forth and that and there's not absolutely nothing wrong with that but the problem is that you know if you actually look under the hood of the company often there's a disconnect between that statement 
of corporate purpose and the actual strategic machinery investment priorities resource allocation and so forth within the company itself uh, and that 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 i think is probably today's version of greenwash it's green wish <laughs> thank you um Stuart, maybe this next question though it's about india but you've studied india quite closely and it perhaps is hinting at your questions on capitalism so this is from Navinder Narang, uh, he says there are better chances of ESG getting the desired outcomes in India because 70% of our population is still in tier three towns and villages, and the rest are in some way connected to the 70%. Any comments? <laughs> well, I guess one, one way, if I maybe if I interpret that question, uh, it would be that that it's it's easier to make significant significant progress if you haven't already gotten 90% of the way there right <laughs> that it's kind of, it's sort of a, a social version of low hanging fruit <laughs> in the eco efficiency space where you know in eco efficiency we've already picked all the low hanging fruit but in the in the larger sort of societal space where we still have you know kind of uh, inequality on a large scale and where there are still these massive kind of negative externalities out in the world that we've talked about beyond the four walls of the companies themselves, there's enormous room for improvement. So that that's absolutely true and certainly the case in India, but also the case, I, I guess one of the, for me, one of the maybe most important sort of wake up calls or realizations is that a lot of my work on sustainability and inequality and base of the pyramid uh, over the last you know, 20, 30 years has been focused on the developing world, you know, appropriately so, right? Since there, that is where the majority of kind of underserved poor people reside. But that the the problems are everywhere, right? The problem of inequality of the uh, in in case of the West, deindustrialization of leaving entire segments of society behind, of disinvesting in communities, that's that's rampant in Europe. That's rampant in the U.S. And, and so we have in the US now our own version of the bottom of the pyramid. Now, there's, it's always been there, right? But I would say in the, in the past, it probably was primarily a problem of race, you know, where, where black and brown people were the ones that were discriminated against. But over the last 40 years of shareholder primacy, we now have a large segment of the white population many of them rural, but not, not exclusively, that have been left behind, right? Their jobs have been outsourced, their communities have been deinvested in, and they're angry, right? And so we, in the U.S. now, we have a significant problem of inequality. In fact, inequality is as high as, it, as it's been since the 1920s in the U.S. at this point in time. So I think this, this problem is a global problem. And, and it's one that, you know, we're going to have to come, come to grips with. And, and I think for better or worse, leadership in the business space can play a really important role in rec first recognizing that this is an issue and then, and then actually doing something about it. So do, do I think there's huge opportunity in India? Absolutely there is, right? And, and, and as Vipul says, there's also, I think, the kind of the historical value system to, to really tap into that. And to make significant headway in the coming years. Thank you. I just Thank want to. I just want to add yeah. something to that, Mukund. Sorry for budging in. So, um, I think if you look at any business, you know, or industry, or sector, or economy, I think they're trying to solve three things at least. You know, was what first is the what? What is it that we are doing? So every company has its kind of you know um, vision statement, uh, or its idea of how it is solving a problem for a customer. And then it has the why, you know, why they want to solve this problem, and you know, but there is the how. I think what and why, you know, most people figure out. Okay, we are a pharma company, we are doing this, or we are a energy company, we are doing this, we are an FMCG company doing this, and and they become very good at it. But the how remains uh, a question mark because you know one can make money in very good ways, and one can make money in very bad ways. You can destroy nature, you can destroy people, you can extract uh, capital from poor pe people and, and concentrate it in a few hands. So, and you can have destroy all types of ethics in the supply chain and in society. So I think it's the how that, that the sustainability and ESG uh, is bringing in that do your business by all means, do your what, do your why, but also take care of the how, because if you take care of the how, 
that can become a differentiator itself over the next you know 20 50 100 years of of the career of the growth of the company you know and you'll have consistent growth for many many years so i think this is this is what we need it's filling in a gap that that companies have in their genes because capitalism why we coming back to the question of capitalism why it has reached this point is because it has become like a license to do anything so make money in any way as you want doesn't matter as long as you hit the quarterly returns as long as you hit the annual returns so i think that gap is is being filled through sustainability and dhg saying no we need to take care of the how as well because if you're going to destroy people along the way you're not going to have customers tomorrow so you're not going to have partners tomorrow you're not going to have water tomorrow to drink so i think it's a holistic way of doing business we need to grow but we need to grow in a balanced way and holistic way well said people uh, <clears throat> i was going to go on with the questions but then i realized we're already 11 minutes over um, six minutes over if you budget for the few minutes at the start uh, there are questions i see for instance double materiality disclosure from Samia Rani. All of these, I have to say, are very well covered in Ripple's book. So maybe the uh, quick way to access uh, answers to some of your questions could be to read his book. But I'm going to now have to call an end to this discussion. As I said, we could go on and on uh, with our fantastic panel, but I think we'll have to keep that for another day. So let me really thank Stuart and Ripple uh, for your awesome perspectives and your participation today. Really appreciate it. Ripple, I'm sure your book is going to help very many ESC practitioners. My grateful thanks also to ABA and FIKI Center for Sustainability Leadership for hosting today's event. And finally, my thanks to our audience who've been interacting very nicely in the chat box as well. I hope you all enjoyed this panel discussion. And we do very much look forward to more such occasions to interact with all of you. So with that, uh, I bring this discussion to an end. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.